So how's it everyone? I know there are still quite a few who are joining at the moment, but we're just going to get, get going in the meantime. But just thanks to everyone for joining. I know it's always difficult this time of the evening, but we've had a huge response for tonight and, and really looking forward to getting going with an exceptional panel that we've got with us tonight, who I will introduce in a second. I think to those of you who haven't been part of one of these before, my name is Stefan Boerta, and I'll be facilitating the chat with our panel. It's actually our 10th Property Insight webinar that has been hosted by Raymaker Marketing, which we're pretty chuffed about. And it has been a while. It's been about seven months since we did our last one. We had quite a big series during the course of lockdown from March to September. Uh, it's probably quite naughty that we haven't done it in a while, but it's also so much has happened. And what's been really encouraging is to see how many of the trends that we spoke about during the lockdown period have actually now started to come through into fruition. I think that's the really exciting part about tonight's discussion is that we're actually talking about even looking further forward than that in terms of what the current trends are, what the evolutions are, and how we really think that the property market will continue to reinvent itself. Um, I think in the intro, we said if one thing that 2020 has taught us is that the property market is ever changing. And I think in, in that lockdown period, we spoke about in our webinars, we spoke about things like micro living, we spoke about smart living, sustainable cities, uh, the future of the office space, the concept of making property investment more or ownership more achievable for all South Africans. And that's all live examples that we're seeing right now. And I think that's what's, what, what's so amazing about what, um, how everyone's had to shift, how everyone's had to reinvent themselves and how there's a really, really great success stories that have come out of it and, and hopefully we'll continue to see going forward. So... Tonight, we're discussing the evolution of uh, these trends, and our topic is the evolution of property trends as a whole, and really excited about a pretty exceptional panel that has a vast amount of experience across all different sectors. So I'll be chucking lots of different questions across the board. I think everyone is very, very capable to answer a whole host of different things, and that includes trends both locally and internationally. I think that's what really, what's really exciting. So if you look at the panel, um, Technically, if one of the panel members wasn't on holiday in the Maldives, we would have, <laughs> we would have someone in Nairobi, someone in Durban, someone in Cape Town, someone in Joburg, uh, someone in Pretoria. And that really is a, a, an incredibly nice spread of, of what's happening um, across the continent as a whole. Um, Aiden is probably sitting with baggies at that college uh, <laughs> time because he's still in the Maldives, but we won't harm that for too long. Mm -hmm. Um, and then just before I introduce the panelists, I just want to express our condolences to Lynette and Tully, who, um, whose mom has passed away yesterday afternoon. She is unable to make it tonight, obviously, and I think our thoughts are just with her and her family during this tough time. And I'm um, very grateful for Michelo, who I will introduce in a second, for stepping in and uh, just the CV speaks for itself in terms of the, the credibility you bring. I'm really, really excited to, to chat to you more this evening. But I think maybe just to start by... Introducing our panel, uh, Preston, I'm going to introduce you first. So Preston Mendenhall, who's the Executive Vice President for Endeavour. Thanks for joining us from Nairobi and really excited to have you here with us. Thanks, Tom. And then just a bit of context. So Endeavour is the largest new city builder in Africa, and that's not a small term. So they currently de de develop or under development in terms of 12,000 hectares of satellite cities. But just to put that into context, that's about 120 square kilometers, which uh, is, 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 is ridiculous. I mean, I think Tartu City, where, uh, where he is right now, I think uh, Preston was mentioned earlier, our team was there probably about two years ago, but it's 2,000 hectares in itself, which is, um, I think as Preston mentioned earlier, the size of Waterfall City. Then Palesa Malloy, who's the founder of Park Up, and really a, a genius concept, linking property owners with unused parking spaces in high demand areas. Uh, absolutely huge demand for that and really cutting edge in terms of what she's doing. And I think she'll also chat a little bit later about how they're also pivoting into other areas. But how's it, Palesa? How's it? Thanks for the invitation. I'm really excited for this conversation. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Yeah. And, and then Rashila Pajeng, who's the manager director of um, Saba Real, which is an asset management company. And Rashila is also the former head of valuations at APSA and then a whole list of other uh, credentials to go with it. So Rashila, how's it done? Uh, thank you, uh, Stefan, for the invitation. Um, our, uh, and condolences uh, goes to Lynette's uh, family um, and our hearts are with them. 
And then finally, Aidan Hart, who's the manager director of in-house. I don't want to give Aidan too much credit. He's really got a lot of credit for the panel members leading up to this. But uh, I think you would have seen it in the, in the bios. Uh, Aidan's team have been responsible for the design of seven NIC head offices around the world. And I think that's really a, a massive South African story, something we can be really proud of. And I know Michelle was talking about having gone to NIC and having gone to uh, Google and how NIC is, is streets ahead. I think it's massive, massive credit to South African business and really excited to hear about how those trends uh, have come about and will evolve what we do going forward. So just a couple of small so things uh, to those of you who are part of the chat. And um, as you will know, there is the option to post questions at the bottom. Please post as many questions as you can. I'm going to direct them onto a team. We won't be able to get through everything, but if we don't, we'll try and, and respond to you directly and, and give you comments. We're going to try and keep this between 45 minutes and an hour. I think we're probably going to be closer to an hour based on the amount of stuff we want to discuss. And, and I expect quite a lot of questions. And then we are doing a recording of this. So you will be able to receive a recording uh, to everyone who registered and, and you can have a look again and you can share it and, and so forth. So I think let's, let's get going if everyone's happy. Yes. Um, Preston, I just want to kick, kick off with you. Um, and I think we spoke a, a lot in, in the bios about satellite cities. Can you just explain what a satellite city entails? Sure. In our case at Rendever, our, our model is based off of uh, three things, and that's economic growth, demographic growth, and then also the rapid urbanization. Africa is the fastest urbanizing continent or region in the world, perhaps in history. So our business is based off of that. When uh, the city, uh, when the rural to urban migration is happening, uh, what is needed are nodal developments on the outskirts of the city in order to take the pressures of urbanization off the CBDs. Um, this has happened um, across the world um, for centuries and longer. And what we see is essentially a repeat um, or a, a similar trend has happened in Asia over the last 30 to 40 years. Now turning to Sub-Saharan Africa, outside of South Africa, there really are no new cities that have been developed. Um, in South Africa, there are very good examples. You mentioned waterfall, the Tongat Hewlett developments. It's even Santon to Johannesburg. It's happened over the last 40 years there. That has not happened in the countries where we operate, Kenya, Ghana, Nigeria, Zambia, DRC. So what we have done is over the last 15 years, we acquired or partnered on large pieces of contiguous land within about anywhere from uh, 15 to 25 kilometers from an existing city center. And then we, can, we ensure that that land has clean, unencumbered land title. When you get change of use, usually from agricultural to mixed use development, uh, and then we put in the infrastructure and the controls on that development. So it's essentially building new cities outside of uh, existing city centers and then having mixed use developments within them. And then Preston, so you mentioned a lot about the African examples. I mean, I think Tonga Tulet is, is synonymous with creating securely managed precincts and waterfalls is another great example and there are a few others that exist. But we as African property professionals all think that we are pretty great at what we do, but there's obviously a lot that we can learn. So what do you think that we can learn most from what's happening outside of our borders? Well, in a South African context, it's, you know, we need uh, to see more South Africans in the geographies where we are, because there's a huge amount of human capital and expertise in, in South Africa that has been developed over the last 20 to 30 years in the real estate sector. And I would say in our markets, we're probably exactly 20 years behind where South Africa has achieved really global world-class standards in real estate. Um, so you know, what, what's to learn? We actually come to South Africa and we did quite a bit before COVID to learn from developments there. And we're very familiar with the ones there. Um, actually Tattoo City, when it was conceived back in 2008 to 2010, there was a lot of study done on Tonga Hewlett's model. Um, we've worked with a uh, great South African uh, consultants, uh, both uh, urban planners, architects. Uh, we have firms now operating within uh, Tattoo City like uh, Bugertman, which has designed multiple facilities at Tattoo City. Yeah. Uh, and we have a number of South African brands. We have Advitech here through Crawford International. The first new school uh, Advitech built outside of South Africa is at Tattoo City. Uh, we have Africa Rainbow Capital here. Uh, in the form of an investment in a cold storage facility. And we also have Distel, 
uh, through their uh, Kenyan entity, Kenya Wines. So there's a, there's a lot of South African content here, South African corporates that are looking for growth in South African companies, uh, service providers, suppliers that are looking for growth outside of South Africa. Uh, you know, it's essentially our invitation to come and visit our markets because in Kenya, for example, um, is, is looking to achieve five to 6% GDP growth coming out of the year of COVID. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity here. Do you, do, you, do you feel that um, that the, that it's a one size fits all kind of solution to to lo looking at cities? I mean, we talk about South African uh, cities like a waterfall city and the Hewlett's uh, development, but there, there there are many cities in in South Africa that haven't had this growth or this opportunity. And is that is that because it's centralized around where the main wealth has been generated or is it is it, is it a difficult thing to say trigger in a in a smaller city um the, or is it something that you feel we could bring across africa and across uh, southern africa well for the the cities to be sustainable they have to be first of all financially sustainable um uh, but they also need to be mixed income and so we place a lot mm -hmm. of focus on continuing not to try to just go for high-end estates within the mixed-use development, uh, but also to ensure that everybody working uh, in businesses at, uh, at these developments can, can also live there. And then in terms of one-size-fits-all, when we look from market to market, so um, our developments are very much demand-driven. Um, we made mistakes in the early years thinking that we could play God and this is the master plan, this is how the city will roll out. Yeah. But then you end, you end up developing something that the market doesn't need. So in Kenya, the first part of our development was really based around industrial groups that came in and we now have about 60 companies in the industrial area. And then the schools and the housing followed. In Ghana, in our development um, just outside of Accra, it's very much a residential play at the beginning with very little industrial. So we really have to be able to react and have a flexible land use plan and master plan in order to accommodate what the market needs. In incredibly uh, long, uh, sorry, incredibly long um, projects is, or they, they, what sort of duration are, are your sort of project lands? When, when we started uh, 10, 10, 12 years ago, we said they would be 10 to 20 year projects and we're still saying okay. they'll be 10 to 20 year projects. So all, all in all, I think, you know, it's easily 20 to 30 years. And you know, we, st oh. we stay in these developments. We don't, we're not a developer that is trying to sell and leave. We are the uh, infrastructure provider. We are the utilities provider uh, in the long term in these developments. You, you uh, actually Lara, yeah. want to ask around um, I mean, um, one of the I mean, one of the trends that we've seen coming around is, and we have learned this thing from Mpesa that the idea that there's a big brother, let's wait for a big brother to provide the telephony infrastructure before I can have a telephone in the house. That the the private sector comes in with innovation, and they actually overtake uh, the big brother infrastructure investment. I mean, how how do you deal with 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 that with that separation between the fact that some of these big developments. I mean, if you look at, um, I recently traveled from Kigoma in the east of um, Tanzania to Dar es Salaam, and there's a big freeway that is being constructed by the private sector, um, the Chinese mostly, purely because they, there's a logistics need to, to access the port. So, so they, there's a trend where the private sector is just coming in and saying, this big brother weight um, is not worth the money that we put in. We'll rather put in the money and we'll, we'll bank the project. Would you say that that is the sort of thing that is happening to make these these big cities um, come on board, or is it something that just an investment purely based on the fact that um, the market is is demanding a certain type of a product? So we're an early stage investor, and in, in all of the land that we've acquired, I, I think you have the the same reaction with many entrepreneurs in their early days. Why in the world are they doing that? That land is so far away. And we've had that in, in all of the markets we've operated in. People think it's far, but within a few years, because of the rapid growth of the cities, they, they reach our doorstep. So you, you, you kind of get past that as well. And then in, to, to the point about the infrastructure, um, we're, we're a private developer. And so although I have, uh, I gave an analogy to Tongat Hewlett and Waterfall City, we are actually doing all the roads within our developments. And that's not the case. The roads, the power, the sewerage, water, um, we, that's our investment in our developments. It's not something the government provides. However, what happens in the period 
since, since our investment, you see that the roads do, the government's investments do then lead to us. Um, the long-term infrastructure projects that are hard to predict when the government are gonna fund um, do uh, reach us. So in the case of Kenya, Tattoo City, when we bought the land uh, in 2008, 2010, there was the Thika Superhighway, which is an eight lane road, which was planned, uh, but nobody knew when it was gonna come into being. And you know, about six or seven years after we bought the land, uh, it was constructed and really connected the land to, to the city. We have the same thing going on in Nigeria now, we're in the Lekki Free Zone and the Lekki Ekpe Expressway, uh, which has been started and stopped many times by the, by the Nigerian government, is actually now being completed. And that's you know, sort of eight, six years into the, the, the time period when we started discussions on our partnership there. I know I'm just looking at your, at your website. There are two stats in there where I found, found it really interesting. It said 12 of the 25 fastest growing countries in the world are African. And it also said that by 2050, one in every four people on the planet will be African, which is a hell of a, hell of a thing. And I guess anything today would be a call to the African developers and stakeholders to look at how they partner with guys like yourselves and really help yeah, wow. grow that footprint um, outside of our boundaries. Yeah, and, and Steph, we, we, we've still got that, uh, that office space. We're ready for Rainmaker. So I'm um, not sure why you're <laughs> yeah. taking so long to sign your lease. <laughs> we are the way, we are the way. <laughs> Um, Aiden, just, just on, on your side, so I think from an architectural and a design trend perspective, what are you seeing outside of the continent that you think is going to um, emerge here in future? I swear, it was a very interesting kind of uh, thought process and I, I was kind of trying to put together ideas on, on how to answer that because the, the last year and a half has been, I would say, a very disruptive kind of design um creator we we've we've, we've 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 had to rethink uh objectives and re and rethink planning ideas and and then so three months later have to rethink them again because the new normal has changed to another new normal um we've been very fortunate uh during this uh, the last two years to be involved in some amazing uh global brands uh, with with access to many different cultures and trends and a common a common thread through most of our global projects is that there is a, a kind of global standard but there is always local alignment and local desire um i would describe it probably as being a sort of 70 30 split where you have a global brand trend and then the 30 percent is a local cultural um, element that comes into play. So even even working for a single brand like Nike, um, we find that each office that we've completed in Istanbul will differ, differ uh, sort of without changing the design look and feel, but the actual desires of the individual um, staff members inside those offices uh, differ from, from country to country and from city to city. So it, it would be difficult for me to say that there's a particular international trend. I do, I do feel that that South Africa and Africa has is at the kind of doorstep of uh, of leading the way with regards to certain aspects. We have a, a much faster um, pickup of 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 design solutions than I would say in Europe or in North, North America. I, I, I think much in in a developing world i see a lot more things happening a lot quicker there's a there's a desire for for experimentation that you don't get when you're starting to deal with european um with european companies and i think it's been part of our successes in our design studio uh with nike is that tenacious uh south african can do kind of attitude as opposed to no we don't we don't do that so that's not part of our scope it's it's very much a we do do that and we we can we can help you so yeah i think i think uh local local standards and local trends are probably becoming more focused on than someone trying to follow um sort of a single global trend if anything covid19 has has broken down the desire to be a more say western solution driven uh, element it's it really gets down to more regional um and i feel that coming through in in, in designs 
right the way through South Africa at the moment. There's some amazing projects that uh, you see that speak about South African and African solutions. Absolutely. And then guys like Nike, I mean, from a spatial planning perspective and facilities, what are they doing that's so cool? So, you know, we, one of the ideas was how, how much has Nike changed their workspace planning philosophy because of COVID-19? And the, the answer from my, from my perspective is very little has changed. And that's mainly because they've, they, they, their work style of their offices, um, as Michelle was saying, is, is it's something unique. They've, they don't have reception, reception desks. They don't have a reception space. You basically walk into... Um, what they call a hub it's a it's a uh, open guest and uh, athlete driven environment uh, and then they break their offices up into neighborhoods and each neighborhood has an identity in the space um, so they've, they've they've been working that we've been working for that in the last five, four to five years working on their offices where where the office environment is geared for uh, what I would say is COVID ready um, because of the way that the, the spaces have been um, sort of set up. Uh, so we haven't changed anything because of COVID-19 and the new projects that are coming up. The COVID-19 workspace planning, I think, is going to be largely around uh, proper sanitization, proper um, sort of screening elements. Um, one of the one of the main changes that I think has happened in in office space design is actually uh, because of lockdowns and the families and close personal connections have been made stronger. Um, we've become more focused on trusted connections on on people we know, we feel we trust them, and this this has resulted in new workspace planning, which is kind of more closed community structure planning where. Uh, we do less outside meetings in our workspace and we, and we want, we, we only want people that we work with uh, on a day-to-day -day basis to be in and around us. And I think that's going to change how workspaces are set up in a lot of ways. These big call center, uh, large footprint floor spaces are going to fall away because people will look to have more personal, uh, safe, protected space within their uh, working environment. And that, that also starts to drive uh, the, in part where micro apartment developments are starting to spring up. I think that's triggered by this kind of need to have something close to your workspace, but also a desire to be further away. You know, your comment about me being not in Cape Town, but in the Maldives, I think is a, is a, a poignant kind of example of how the world has changed. You know, we, I'm, I'm running our Moscow project from here, or I can run it from Cape Town where I used to get on a plane 10, 15 times a year in 2019. I haven't traveled once uh, up until now. Um, and we've still been able to run projects on a global level. So that, and that's incredible. That's, a, that's an amazing change. Yeah. And I think exactly like you're saying is, is wherever guys are pushing the boundaries, whether it be retail, commercial, or residential, there's such good spillover into other sectors. And exactly what you're saying, the commercial innovation is spilling over into residential innovations and just... Yeah challenging everyone in terms of how they look at spaces and usage of that, which is, which is brilliant. Absolutely. So, Palesa is talking about better utilization of space. Um, can you maybe just give us a bit of an intro in terms of what Park Up is and how that idea came about? Sure. So, um, how I actually started Park Up, <laughs> well, why, the, why I actually started the company probably a couple of reasons, right? So I've always known that I wanted to sort of become a, an entrepreneur, whether I'm running a small little store, selling products, you know, whatever it may be, or running a big tech company like um, I'm trying to now with my startup. Um, I've just always loved solving problems. So here I was, I'm serving uh, my articles to become a chartered accountant. Um, I was assigned to a pro project in um, Grandfontein and I had to park on, on the side of the street because I'm a trainee, right? So we didn't have allocated parking spaces within like a safe and secure um, facility. So I, I made a plan for myself, um, spoke to a security guard, you know, cause I love forming relationships in any case. And I just used, <laughs> usually used to like <laughs> from lunch, whatever, um, give him whatever I could give him to let me park there. 
But the problem was my peers still didn't have parking. So I then um, formed a relationship with this guy and then connected him to the to my other peers who needed parking. And that's pretty much how Park Up was born. I was just constantly thinking about this parking issue. Um, but initially our idea was completely different to what we're doing now. So we started off with um, trying to improve the um, parking experience for shopping centers where you would on your app, um, obviously be able to book a parking spot, pay for it, but also be able to see the occupancy as in like where are the parking spots that are um, open and all of that stuff. But then along the way, we realized that it's not um, as sustainable and it's also, you know, it's not easy to do something like that, especially because currently sensors are still quite expensive and the technology behind it was just not feasible. Um, we got into a couple of um, accelerators in Cape Town, um, you know, a, a few accelerators actually. And that's when we realized that this is not going to work. And I was walking the streets of Ops. We saw cars parked on the side of the road and then right next, next to them, parking lots were empty. So we're like, why is this actually happening? And I think Mashila, or Mashilo, sorry, mentioned it while we were speaking just before this, that the way our cities were built, right? Um, they were not built for um, sort of people owning their own cars. They were built for people to use public transport. And that's why you had that ratio of one to, I think he said a hundred um, of parking spaces. So yeah, Park Up was born. And now what we're doing is that we're connecting property owners that have empty parking spaces to companies, um, entrepreneurs, co-working spaces that need um, parking spaces. Um, we may mainly focus on commercial parking spaces. So for example, the shopping centers, um, some office spaces, et cetera. We did want to get into the residential market, but there, there are a lot of um, safety concerns when it comes to that. So imagine somebody just parking in your garage, you have to open you know, your um, gate for them and that sort of thing. There's a, a lot of um, safety issues when it comes to that. So yeah, here we are 2021. Of course, 2020 was hard for us. Um, I think during lockdown, the first lockdown that we had in April, we had to freeze people's parkings accounts and we didn't have an a, a, um, revenue for that month, which is hard for a startup as you would imagine. But we, we're still venturing on. We've got about 6,000 parking spaces on our platform at the oh, moment. Um, amazing. Yeah, over a million on behalf of property owners. So, and we've got a team of six. <laughs> so we grow. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> a, I love that. That's such a, that, that tenacity of, uh, of, of how ideas are born. Uh, well done, Palesa. That's incredible. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, Palesa and, and, and Sheila, I'm going to ask you the same question. Palesa, so you know how passionate I am about your model and how I believe it's going to transform the residential space in terms of residential developments within high demand areas, Sanson, mm. et cetera, yeah. et cetera, as we've seen the, the successes there already. But are we going to get a change? Are people going to see the value of not owning a car? in terms of the cost saving of not paying insurance and monthly repayments, all that kind of stuff, if they have the ability to be able to utilize public transport based on being situated in high demand areas with things like half train and Uber and all that kind of stuff is really accessible. What are your thoughts there? Are we seeing a shift there? Um, Mashilo also said this before the call. <laughs> He's just answered all my questions. But I think it depends, you know. Um, <laughs> People love their convenience, you know, people just love jumping into their car, getting somewhere, they don't want to wait for something. But also at the same time, you know, if you don't have a car or you mainly use public transports that's obviously accessible like the car train, and now we have Uber, that's made, you know, um, things a lot easier in terms of people being able to commute in like those short distances, etc. I think that we're not going to get to a point where like completely everyone doesn't have a car and people are using public transport. We, we definitely going to have the mix that we have now and that's going to continue. Um, and in terms of insurance, we have the likes of naked insurance, for example, that are innovating in that space where if you're not using your car and it's parked um, at home for a certain amount of time, 
whether you're using public transport or you, you've traveled overseas, you can actually switch off your insurance and only pay for what you, you've used. So no, I don't think we're gonna get to, to that point purely because people love their convenience, um, especially for like long distance travel, you know, when families are taking um, long um, road trips, friends and family are taking road trips, et cetera. It's still a nice experience to do that, but I guess, you can still go and rent out a car. It really depends, in my yeah. opinion. Yeah. But Sheila, what are your thoughts there? Look, I mean, we, we <clears throat> sorry, we had a chat, um, I suppose, earlier on. Here's my view, is that sometimes for an industry to innovate, it has to borrow from others. Um, mm. uh, the, 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 this, this approach, I mean, I always use this example that for, for Ford to solve an assembly problem, they looked at the beverage industry. Uh, because, I mean, in those days, most of us here would know that you had to manually make a car one by one. So you order a car, you get it in three years or some funny, something like that. So, and they saw the innovation of an assembly line in another industry. And the same would apply in this environment that, so, so what are the basics? The basics is that in this country, 90% of parking outside of the shopping centers and your big office buildings, which essentially they've designed the parking for themselves, um, for self-use, is that majority is owned by municipalities, between municipalities and public entities, and majority of it right now is laying fallow. Nobody's using it. Um, yeah. So the first thing is to release that in a way that, you know, you, you come up with something that Palace has come up with. You release it within that environment. So that's the one thing. The second thing is that I think we, one of the things we take for granted is the decision that, that goes to choosing whether you need to drive or you need to be on how train. And the, and the choice is, it's influenced, for me, it's influenced by three things. One is the cost of the trip. Um, how much does it cost me to move from point A to point B compared to if I was on a how train plus the bus on the how train? So from my house to Bryanston, if I drive, um, I can take a how train and I can take a bus to how train. It's probably cost me the same. Um, but the, 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 the actual trip itself is that now I must worry about, now I must wait for the bus, I must now take the bus to Bryanston. It's cheaper to take the how train, but that hassle of that trip means I'll end up driving. So there's that decision. Yeah. And then there's an actual cost decision. And the next one is about the question that Palisa was asking when we were talking to say, do we drive to, do I drive to Joburg when I go to Joburg, do I not? And I said, the choice is based on what am I gonna do there? Um, mm -hmm. And nine out of 10, I think in this country, one of the difficulties around the, the mode of transport is, is actually not about the mode. My choice is not about my convenience necessarily. It's about what else happens with that mode. What happens when I get to my destination? Would, would, would I be able to, to, to when I get off um, how train in Santon, can I get to my meeting in, in, in uh, Benrose, for example? You know, how difficult it yeah. is to get there. So yeah. I'll end up driving because it's easier for me to pack for my meeting, get to my meeting and go back. So those decision points become very important in the design of how we innovate, all right? And, 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 and in that instance, then I'll say, it's the same way people ask the question to say, is retail dead? No, retail is not dead. It's because we're not gonna start walking around naked because we have COVID. Or we're not gonna stop eating because we have COVID. <laughs> that the behavior would be different. Uh, we're still gonna do the same thing, but we'll behave differently. Um, so the same with, with, with models like Pack Up to say, how do we borrow from, let's say, A, B, and B? Mm -hmm. Where essentially you are renting my back room and the safeties that goes with it uh, for a particular time for a fee, that creates a convenience. And, and I'll think to respond to your question, I'll say the answer lies in how Airbnb delivers their model. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the answer around how we innovate, particularly on parking. I mean, I don't understand why a shopping center at night, when it closes the parking, just stands there. And there's a lot of other people who are parking the street. So we can multi-use, we can multi-share. So during the night, um, a shopping center parking used as parking. There's no shopping. In the morning, those people leave and the shoppers, they can come in and they use the parking. So those are some of the innovations that I think could happen. Yeah, with you 100%. Payson, I know you want to add to that. Yeah, I wanted to pose a question to Palissa or ask for her feedback, <clears throat> which, which can come offline. If this is probably a more complicated question. But we're, we're in a unique position as Rendever because it, our cities and especially the CBDs of our cities are coming into shape after the invention of Uber, Lyft, et cetera, ride shares. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the way we have to think about parking is not as formulaic as it was before. 
So on the one hand, we have that opportunity. On the other hand, we're in high growth markets where people are going to want and own a want to own a car for ease of transport and as a status symbol for many, many years to come. So the sort of the catch up of Uber and Lyft may come later. How do we how do we plan? You know, how does somebody look 10 years in the future and understand what their parking requirements would be, taking into consideration ride share and, and then also um, innovations like yours at Arca? Sure. Um, I love this, this question because it's what we're doing for one of our clients. I don't know if I'm allowed to mention their name, but it's also a development um, company well known in South Africa. They also do um, residential development. And what they've done is that they've looked at the um, occupancy rates of parking spaces in and around, you know, the, the area in which they're developing. And they've said, OK, cool. These parking spaces are 90 percent um, unoccupied. Why don't we just use those spaces because you're right people are still going to want to buy their cars and all of that stuff so in the, that particular development they're not going to be building as much parking as is required by the law yeah. because they're going to be using a solution like park up where now we are coming in with our stock and people will be able to park there and we're going to be using things like the tuk tuk to take people back to the development itself so these are the yeah the solutions that we are coming up with we're working with some of the um, big REITs as well um, and some property funds in the country that, you know, also want to use our solution exactly for that, where they're no longer building too much parking or over providing, but they're kind of using, or co it's a collaborative consumption um, platform. So they're using our platform to be able to share those spaces as opposed to building new ones. And that's exactly what yeah. our solution is about, yeah. That's I suppose the, good, yeah. the elephant in the room is that, um, it, 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 and this is the thing we're talking about when Preston was, was presenting around the pool effect, um, where uh, you either wait for the big brother and you don't, you don't put down your investment, or the example we're using in Tanzania and in Nairobi, where in Nigeria, the example that is used, that they deliver what they need to deliver, and it pulls that, 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 that public supply of infrastructure. The same would, would apply in this instance to say, we, would, we still have to figure out what will be the response of, I mean, I mean, the, the rights givers are your municipalities, right? So if a municipality yeah. says, to me, I need six bays per hundred, do I, do, are, are they saying the six bays per hundred must be exactly in my development? Or do they allow me to do, uh, as we call, use share? So I don't have to have um, the, the hundred uh, or the six bays here, but I can have the six bays on the app somewhere else, but I'm still allowed the same amount of rights to do the Absolutely. development. So those are some of the modalities that we still need to work through. Whether those authorities think like that or not, you know, I mean, it's the debate, and I like Preston, what you raised around Uber, whether are we ripe for it or are we ripe for it later, you know, um, and, and, and how the, the authorities deal with the relationship between uh, the existing cabs model and the, the, you know, the, the, the Ubers of this world when they are, how do they accommodate in that environment? Because at the end of the day, we, we operate within an environment that has rules that needs to apply. So the, the challenge with, with some of these things, and, and you see, and then I'll make an example about something that is that are happening recently. So everybody else is trumpeting the thing around green buildings. Oh, let's all go green. So um, I, I didn't have power for the last two days because for some weird reason, um, it came back and I was worried, uh, Stefan, after we see, when we were talking <laughs> yesterday, I, didn't have power, by the way. I was worried it came back at two o'clock this afternoon. So um, to say, would I be able to make it? Now, these things about green buildings, right? The, the most important thing is that one, ESCOM has issued a regulation or some, some suggestion that says that they will begin to charge you for your, for your green energy. Sure. Dobek municipality have issued some bylaw. I don't know whatever they issued last or two weeks ago. They say they will start levying 50 rands for every household uh, for the waste separation, whatever story they were telling about waste management. So some of these innovations, and that's why I'm raising the issue of the response of the authority. Some of these innovations from our perspective as entrepreneurs may sound quite very innovative, but on the other side, the, 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 the response that Preston and the team got in the part of the world where they are, and, and I can say from experience, because I've traveled to that part uh, early last day before COVID, um, and, and previously that the response is slightly different from what we're doing. You don't get punished from being innovative, you get collaboration for being innovative. 
And, yeah. and those are some of the things we need to look at to say, you don't want a sort of a response when, when Palace are partners with a developer to say, there is a solution that we bring and that solution gets be interpreted as an opportunity to increase the level of regulation um, as opposed to responding to that innovation as a pool to bring new things into the environment. Uh, so I know Joburg is going ahead with the 50 rands for your, for every household is gonna pay 50 rand extra because they need to separate waste. I don't know. Um, ESCOM is gonna go ahead. Um, if you put an, an alternative energy beat, gas beat, whatever they're gonna charge you, you're gonna pay them for the fact that you've got a solar at your house. So, so those are some of the things that we need to also look at and say, these are some of the trends that would influence the rate at which um, the real estate sector is, is changing or the rate at which it will slow down with innovation. And, mm -hmm. and if we don't respond to those equally, then the rate at which entrepreneurs comes into the market gets affected. Uh, and that demand pool um, gets eroded over time. We have seen it with, with the, the blue lights on the freeways where the, 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 the legislature scores a particular direction and the market is facing in a particular direction, and we end up in a clash uh, with these e-tolls. We're being, we're being in that loggerheads for now, it's going for 10 years. And that's what you don't want in the market. Um, you don't want that, 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 that clash because it means that everything else doesn't happen. And we lose an opportunity to some of these, these big things that are happening, the same ones as Preston was talking about, and we're not able to innovate. Hmm. I think, uh, you know, on the question of kind of uh, government uh, or, 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 you know, municipal involvement, there, there, are, there are situations where the uh, municipality has in some of our development projects worked with us in aligning parking, um, off-site parking, um, and park up, park up uh, would be something with that kind of information well, I don't know if you're using uh, AI algorithms to, to try and uh, be able to provide uh, proper data into the situation. I do see there's a future for that. And I think, um, you know, to Michelle's uh, point, when, when, you're, when you're aligned and you're all working together with government, it's easier. Um, and I, but I feel there, there is enough uh, motivation in, in areas in, in South Africa to, to align on those bases. There will be some areas that you, you find you run into legislation or, or red tape, but uh, I, I see it as a great future in, in, in being able to reduce um, the absolute massive building requirements for, around parking if we are able to pool spaces across uh, it's very similar to what Nike is doing with with the desk space they only have 70 uh, desks per hundred uh, athletes you 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 don't get an assigned desk but inside their work environments they have 200 opportunities for you to work for every hundred people so they're saying well you don't get a personal desk we use that real estate to create working collab spaces um, opportunities and it's a very similar thing that you're doing where you're trying to find parking that is not dedicated and empty half the night, um, half the day. Uh, it's very, very clever and a good initiative. Thank you. Uh, just, just quickly, so I know, I know Donnie de Villiers had a question that said, how would you ensure security in those parking spaces? I, I want to move on uh, from parking a little bit now, but um, I, I'd place, I know that is part of the app and I think biometrics is quite a big thing in terms of how it is regulated, if I'm correct. Yes, so um, like I said, um, the parking spaces that we have on our platform are mostly commercial with, you know, the necessary security, et cetera. So if, if for example, with the residential development that we were speaking of earlier, the offsite parking is a commercial space with yeah. the necessary, um, you know, safety and security measures in place. But also what's interesting, I think Aidan um, um, mentioned this, that around data, so on our platform, how we work is that we've got a license plate recognition um, system in the background that's working and we're collecting people's license plate numbers. So eventually what we wanna do is that we want to connect that to some kind of SAP system because I do know somebody is, is already um, doing something similar to that for security reasons. So you see, these are kind of, you know, the, the data that we have and the potential that it has to sort of become that you know, big app that's providing spaces, but also that safety and security and sort of feeding the right information to the right channels. 
So yeah, there is a lot in the works and there is a lot that we can do with the data that we have on our system. Okay, perfect. Preston, just one thing, I, mean, I know from Rendeavour's perspective, you guys have spoken from when we first met you guys in terms of how mixed income development is a, is a huge thing. So, I mean, we wholeheartedly believe when you look at longer term projects and you're talking 10, 20, 30 years, they can't be sustainable unless you, you're creating mixed income opportunities throughout the development in terms of different price points, different products, appealing to a broader market and basically making property ownership more achievable across the board. How big a part of, of, of that is in, your, is in the planning you guys do when it comes to your cities? So it's, it's a major part, but, but because we, we follow the market first, it, it's not necessarily the part that we start with because we want the project to be financially uh, sustainable and relevant to the market. But what we find is as the, as the developments mature, and you've covered sort of the mid to upper end, um, it's, it's, that's when you can start trying to bring the cost of properties down because you've found the right developers, you've established the credibility of the project, and you've also created the, the business need and the business case to have lower income housing to serve the businesses that have established there. So it's at that point that we look for a broader partnership in, in which you know, the, the, the pro proposals we pursue right now are where we, um, are part of the development of large-scale affordable housing where we're contributing uh, equity in the form of land. Um, you're looking for offtake from the government or let's say large corporates that want to buy for their employee base uh, and then bringing in DFIs to fund it. And in that model, we can bring the cost of um, uh, an apartment, say a, a one-bedroom apartment, um, down to about 20,000 US dollars, which is generally considered um, in the affordable range and certainly within the distance we are from major cities, you know, again, 20, 20 to uh, 25 kilometers. Uh, wow. It's very urban affordable, I would say. And, and do you find having that mix can be pretty complementary? It, it, it can because you know, it, we're at the stage now where we have uh, the two schools that are open, Nova Pioneer and Crawford. Um, and, you know, you want those teachers and families to be uh, living near near school, um, and you know, we we've, we found that already that uh, people are you know, the old live work play concept that we all know and use so well um, is is really happening now where people are living working and enjoying the amenities at, at these cities. Okay, um, uh, Sheila, I just want to bring you in there quickly. I mean, I, it, it, it was it was something we discussed at length in, in some of our webinars was the whole concept of making property ownership more achievable and how we felt there was a massive knowledge gap in this country that came from people understanding the benefits of, of building wealth through property ownership and how that just sort of filters back into the economy. And that started by um, education of property, but it also came to the delivery of the right product from developers. Do you think we're making progress in that area? Yes, we are. I mean, um... So one, one of the things, and in and, and the intro, intro we mentioned, um, I sort of have a, a role somewhere with, with the uh, South African Institute of Black Property Practitioners, and I think they run a program on, on, on development and, and, and entry-level investments. Because, they, I mean, think about it, the profile of a South African investor and a South African buyer, and the statistics that are released on a regular basis, uh, that says that... Your, your, your typical South African buyer is black, is female, and is single, right? And, 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 and they've, they've surprised your traditional, what we, in the bank environment, we say we used to call it a traditional market. So in, in essence now, the so-called traditional market doesn't exist anymore because in, uh, since, uh, 2000 and, since uh, around 2009, 2010, until now, the South African residential property markets actually driven largely on affordable housing. And that's the stuff that Preston was talking to. That it's driven largely by affordable housing. So if you're not in the affordable housing market or if the affordable housing market didn't exist, um, then our, 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 our residential sector would have collapsed, literally. Um, and then, then you look at the investment market. If you look at the investment market and the type of product that are coming there, it's your, I mean, the guys that are, let's look at the investors first. Most of them are young. By young, I'm talking about the age of 40 and below. And they're not doing these mega developments. I mean, they buy a block of flats somewhere in Tefontaine. It's got 12 units. 
um, they buy it for two million, renovate it, rent it out. So, so you, they, there's a large game that's playing at that level, um, particularly on the outset of the cities where there's been a lot of decay um, and there's public sector money that's been pumped into that environment. The, 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 I, I'm not sure if the challenge then is education. I think the challenge is some of the upstream stuff, uh, whether is do we, does the lenders, uh, I mean, in, in South Africa for DFIs to participate, I don't think DFIs understand real estate. Majority of DFIs in this country don't, don't, don't have a play in, in property. Um, they, 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 are, they, are, they are playing properties probably around 1%. Whereas if you look everywhere else, I mean, if you look at Australia, um, uh, property services contribute 7% of the GDP. In, 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 so so, so the, the, the challenge is not necessarily knowledge. It used to be, and it still plays a role. I'm not underplaying it, but they still, the upstream stuff, like um, how we package products, particularly whether it's access to finance, how we access finance, um, I know in the in the old days, um, and old days I'm talking '90s, there used to be a product because we used to struggle to open even a simple uh, bank account. There used to be a product called Mzanzi or something like that. You can open it with ten bucks. Um, now in in the real estate sector, we need our own Mzanzi. You know, like an yeah. entry level product that can allow people into the ladder. You don't have it. So in this country, in order for you to get onto the ladder, you're coming in at about five hundred. Um, the stuff at 350 entry level stuff mostly are government driven. Um, they take a long time to deliver. Um, you are coming if you want bonded stuff or if you want proper properly financed stuff. You are between 500 and 700, um, at yeah. least 800. That's what we call cheap. But if you go outside of South Africa and you look at some of the products that are being delivered, um, that that we are, we are not there. And then I think it's a product issue more than a knowledge issue. And both the product in terms of the type of product that we're delivering and the price at which you are delivering that product. And also it is an access issue, money issue, um, that we still, we want to apply traditional um, finance practices to a market that is essentially new. Most black people came into the property market officially from 1994. So it's a product that is about 20, 20 odd yeah. years old, but you want to apply a model that is eight years old the two mismatch, um, it's not gonna work out. At some point, something's got to break and we can see with the amount of land evasion that are happening that something has already broken. We just need to figure out how to fix it and maybe uh, building mega cities that are geared at mixed income might be a solution um, and, and packaging them in a much better way, but the financial sector has to play a role in that packaging. Uh, uh, Sorry, um, do you, just going back to Preston's kind of uh, price line on the to the twenty thousand dollars was it on a on a on a unit price? Yes, um, I mean that's that, that's a remarkable value uh, offer there, uh, and that that is uh, Michelle, as you saying, you don't get that, you don't find that in South Africa, and is do you feel that's a profit taking? Um, situation up front that 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 there as opposed to a desire to deliver um affordable housing there is just too much desire to try and milk out uh you know the the the, the, the new buyers or is there an opportunity for us to change that look the, the two things happened in in in, in south africa, or they're happening in south africa that and and i Look, it's very extractive that I can agree with you. Whether whether it's margin squeezing, uh, Aiden, I, I, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not a developer, so developers will answer that. But it's very extractive. So, because two things are happening right now. The, the price per unit or the price per square meter of a, a and, and, and I'm quite impressed with the, the $20,000 $20, $20, that, 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 that person is talking about. But the two things that happen in this country is that the price per square meter is rising and is rising fast. It's faster than, um, it's growing at faster than an inflation rate. But the size of the units are decreasing. Um, yeah. So essentially you are getting less for more money. <laughs> and, and that's what we, we then define. So it becomes very difficult uh, because at the bottom, so if you are a family of a mother, a father and two kids, or you are a mother with two kids or you are a father with two kids, Essentially, you, you are stuck with a 42 square meter house um, yeah. uh, that, that has, has non-existent. A kitchen is like one square meter, you know. Um, so, so those kind of things, when I say packaging, it's, it's those kind of things where 
you're not only squeezing a margin, you are literally squeezing even the actual product. Um, and and you, I mean, it's okay to have an offtake uh, if you're a developer, uh, but you don't, you, 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 squeezing a, a margin plus the offtake is just, it's just an overkill. So we need to move to those levels that Preston was talking about where you can deliver a unit, the same square foot, two square meters at 120 and the top up to get to 200,000 or 240 is actually your developer's margin. That is fine, uh, but to deliver 42 square meters at 1 million rent, I mean, that, uh, I mean that, that, that's, if you look at the square meter rates, uh, it, it boggles the mind. Uh, how do we get there? It happens because it's demand driven. There is a demand for it. So, so there's a demand push. And basic economics says if you're going to access demand, you, you're going to have a price pressure. And I think we must give credit to the fact that there's also a demand pressure that is, that is driving that price. But um, Sheila, uh, Aiden will tell you if you've got a good Arctic, you don't need a lot of space, hey? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> anytime, anytime. We can pay up and become developers from tomorrow, me and him. Uh, but but I, think, I think just to your point then, I, I agree with what you're saying. I think one of the big things where we've seen such good momentum in the market in the last six or seven months has definitely obviously been the interest rates. And I know we haven't spoken about it, but specifically for us, that interest rate being low, I think the big part of, of the education with a lot of people is not understanding that the money they're potentially wasting every month on rentals could be substituted into a bond at, at very much the same price. And I, I know that's a whole different discussion itself, but I, I really do believe that that's also part of the education in terms of understanding that if you can get a bank to lend you money and you can spend the same amount as you would on rentals for bond repayments, then it, it, it's, a, it's a really, really sort of uh, way to step up the ladder. But in, to, in terms of space, and I just want to chat quickly uh, about micro living you, you know how much i love the topic and <laughs> what, I, what i what i love is that in high demand areas through clever architecture we found are, are finding a way and, and it's been done successfully i know it's a whole thing it's, it's driven by demand and, and and various different things but where we're seeing guys compromising size for developers supersizing facilities and i mean i i, I that i get and that excites me but in that space, Aidan, from a spatial and facility planning perspective, what are the trends there that are going to differentiate developments going forward? Look, uh, you know, as you as you mentioned, the the kind of facilities that are attached to micro apartments are are, are probably where the differentiation between what what is a, a a trendy kind of word at the moment and a product that will last the test of time. Yeah. Um, you know, but micro apartments are not necessarily only de development driven at the moment. There, there's a you know, with population increases inside cities, the cost of of the of the property and the land that is locked up in the middle of those cities is, is you know, drives the per square meter value up, um, but also then starts to push out uh, most people from being able to afford a regular sized apartment. I also think that there's a there's a desire for individuals to have lock up and go um, opportunities uh, and 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 to gain that kind of freedom. I do think some of that uh, decluttered lifestyle um, kind of need has come out of this COVID nineteen pandemic globally. Is this this the realization that you don't you don't need as much as you previously thought you did and. Uh, and so the the trend the trend to to being able to kind of have something smaller, but to make sure that it's detailed and designed properly, and and the the quality of the finishes. So to set aside a good development would be quality a quality development with really good facilities. Uh, either they're uh, developed within the building uh, structure itself, or they're um associated very close by um you know your food your living and your work services uh, i think the other trend with uh, this work from home uh, desire is uh, there, there's been a lot of um talk about moving out of cities so people are now uh, moving to bigger and cheaper properties further out of cities because now they don't have to commute uh, as much but then the need to possibly have a small micro apartment within the city, um, you know, I'm looking at micro apartment development uh, in Amsterdam because I travel regularly and it makes a lot more sense for me to have 
um, something uh, that that belongs to me financially than to go and pay hotels uh, every time I'm, I, I go overseas. Uh, but now, if you were living outside of the city, maybe in one of Preston's new kind of city developments, and you and you needed to travel into the city, you were able to um, go to a micro apartment. So I think that decentralized uh, kind of living compact main base inside the city is the is the kind of the trigger that's helping drive this micro apartment development uh, situation. Uh, Stefan, I mean, I mean, and to Aiden, uh, I mean, there was somebody recently who mentioned a point that if, if I have to have a choice, I mean, COVID taught us that can I, do I buy a 1 million rent uh, apartment in Santin or do I buy a 500 in Santin and a 500 in the Western, in Cape Town? And I can commute between the two if I have to be in two places. Um, and, and it's a trend that I think Aiden is right. Um, I picked it up recently, uh, literally about a week ago in a conversation um, where the, the, uh, somebody was saying, look, I would sell my, my, my house in wherever they live in Johannesburg and I'll buy a much smaller house um, and I'll split that investment between, because I have to be two weeks in Cape Town, two weeks in Johannesburg. So I'll rather, instead of a, a 1.5 million rand house uh, or apartment in wherever they live, Sunning Hill, I'll rather have a, a seven, buy one of these 750 at Waterfall or wherever else apartment yeah. in, in Johannesburg then have another. I, I'm, I'm still invested. I'm still invested for 1.5. So and do that. And in the times where and this is where some of the innovations policy I was talking about come in. So my two weeks in Johannesburg um, and the two weeks I'm away. Then I can rent out the two weeks in Cape Town for some bit of money. Um, there's a new word called multi availability uh, as opposed to multitasking. I need to be available in many places at the same time. So, <laughs> The time that I'm not available in Johannesburg, I sell that time to somebody else, um, either in a form of space or in a form of uh, physical availability. So, so those are some of the things that are coming up to say it is not only adding around, it's actually around that what, I, what is a new term it's called multi-availability. I need to be available in so many places and I can't just live in hotels. So, and yeah. I can afford a certain amount. So what I'm going to do is I will be available in those spaces, but I will invest in a, uh, my availability. I'll buy a half in Johannesburg and I'll buy half in Cape Town. Um, and then I'll still be available in both places uh, by investment physically because I've got that and then I have the flexibility. Um, and it's something that um, as a company, we want to investigate and see to, to what degree it makes sense. It, it could have a market, it could build a market. And I'm, I'm quite interested to speak to Aiden about it to say, uh, you know, um, within the environment of micro units. This is a real product that is beginning to develop. Um, and we're gonna see it develop, particularly because cities are starting to become very compact. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, guys, we're gonna have to wrap up. Um, there's unfortunately so much more we'd like to get through. I know, um, Andisa, you've asked about working from home trends. Uh, Anna Dani, you have commented about um, how you think there's been a growth in working from home trend by 35%. I don't know the stats on hand, but it, it seems pretty right. Pales, I know you pivoted uh, quite heavily in the last little while also into the, the shared workspace area. So those are all discussions we're going to have to say for another day, but um, we will make sure we get you guys back for another day. And um, Preston, there's so much more we'd also like to unpack from your side. And I think what you guys are doing is... is, is Pretty inspirational, I think, to covering Kenya, Ghana, Nigeria, Zambia, Zambia, and Congo. It's a hell of a thing, and um, yeah, it's it's it's. I just really hope that more South African developers and and property professionals can partner with you guys in terms of what you're doing and fulfil the role that guys like um, Attack and Tonga and all those guys have have done within South Africa in terms of creating these managed precincts that everyone else can benefit off um, in the long term. But uh, thanks, everyone. We're going to be doing this once once a quarter. And um, yeah, I really look forward to um, chatting to you guys again. We will be sharing the copy of this rec um, recording for everyone who's registered so you guys can share it and uh, there will be a copy on YouTube and so forth. But um, thanks for joining us and I hope you guys all have a wonderful evening and a week ahead. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Thanks, guys. Thank you, Thanks everybody. Cheers,